When I first played Wario Land, I actually really didn't like it. <laughs> I thought it was slow, it controlled kind of weird, and it didn't really seem like anything special. I didn't give it another chance until years later after I played the other Wario games. I liked those, and I wanted to go back and see this game's roots. And I'm really glad I did. Mario Land 3, Wario Land is really something special. But before we head straight into the game, I think it's important to look at the development behind this game and its predecessor, so you can really appreciate what kind of game it is. In interviews about the game that came before this, Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins, the developers said they really wanted to try something out of the norm for the Mario games. They didn't make the mainline Mario games that released on consoles like Mario 3 and Mario World, and because of that they weren't really accustomed to Mario projects. One of the first big differences of this game compared to other Mario games was that Mario wasn't questing to save a princess in this one. He actually was adventuring for his own benefit. Mario's castle gets stolen by a new villain, Wario. This weird, egotistical, greedy, grotesque version of Mario. The Mario Odyssey official art book actually says that Wario specifically wore a hat and overalls as a disguise so he could easily capture Mario's castle. I think that's an interesting tidbit. Wario's definitely an interesting take on a rival character, being a weird, more grotesque version of the original. He's a lot more silly and slapstick in nature. In a lot of ways, Mario Land 2 is pretty similar to Mario World. Mario's sprite looks a lot like Mario World, the spin jump is back, and there's a huge, connected world to go through. It still did a lot of unique things, though. Coins have more important use, that would later carry over to the Wario games. There's lots of creative enemies that just never came back to the Mario series. There's a new bunny Mario power-up, which they definitely should bring back. There's a lot of unique level themes that I wish Mario games would use these days. There's the Space Zone, 15 years before Mario Galaxy. There's the Macro Zone, where you shrink down and fight ants. There's the Mario Zone, which is toy-themed, and is also called the Mario Zone. There's an area called the Pumpkin Zone. It's horror-themed, there's little Friday the 13th Goombas, and they're literally called Jasons. I, I love it. It's really cool how creative they got with it. The game's kind of open world, too. You can do any of the zones in any order you want. You just have to beat them all in order to fight Wario and get Mario's castle back. I think that trying to deviate from the norm really paid off. And even though it's a bit of a more obscure Mario game, most fans who know about it are gonna tell you you definitely should not skip out on this. It's a great game. And just a year later, when they were making a sequel, they wanted to go even further with that idea of just breaking the conventions of Mario. Even though the developers just made Mario Land 2, Mario still wasn't the kind of game they were used to making. Mario wasn't solely their creation, but Wario was, so they felt a lot closer to Wario. They felt less restricted using Wario, because he was their own creation. And so with this sequel trying to break the conventions of Mario even more, they decided to just toss Mario out, make it a game about Wario instead. And I guess the rest is history, here we have the game. Super Mario Land 3, Wario Land. Wario Land's instruction manual has a little story description in it, picking up right after Mario Land 2. It literally starts with the line, Remember Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins? Wario tried to take over Mario's castle, but he didn't have much luck. Wario, being the persistent guy he is, has not given up. Now, he wants a castle more than ever before. One day, Wario was practicing being mean when he thought to himself, Rumor has it that the pirates of Kitchen Island have stolen the giant golden statue of Princess Toadstool. Mario's looking for it. But if I find it first, I could cash it in for a princess's ransom. With that cash and the pirates' other treasures and coins, I could buy a palace that's way bigger than Mario's pathetic excuse for a castle. Ga ha ha ha! What am I waiting for? Full of confidence, Wario took off. He didn't even stop to think of how tough the brown sugar pirates were. Their leader, Captain Syrup, was known the world over for being a really rotten and ruthless guy. Can Wario find the coins and treasures hidden on Kitchen Island? What will his new palace look like? Will he keep being so mean and ugly? Let's find out! And yeah, let's find out for ourselves. Let's see how the game starts out. So turning on the game, there's a little scene of Wario in a rowboat chasing down a pirate ship. He just bashes it with his arm and strikes a pose. And then the title card appears, Mario Land 3, Wario Land. Pressing start on the title screen, we're taken to a file select screen, which has a surprising amount of personality. Wario just charges in using his signature shoulder bash, and he loses his Mario-style hat. 
which he replaces with a safari hat you see on the wall that actually is on a visible hat rack. It's a weird attention to detail that I really enjoy. So yeah, there's three save files, and they're represented by the Mario staple warp pipes. And there's a fourth pipe that's slightly higher up that you can use to delete your save data. What I actually really like about this is you actually need to like hit A to jump onto the last pipe, which is how you would do it in regular gameplay. And I think that's a really interesting way to like prevent people from accidentally losing their save. You actually have to have like a, a certain knowledge of how to get up there and it's sort of a fail safe in a way. But if you do willingly choose to go in, Wario actually comes out as a bomb. And this isn't a necessary inclusion at all, but I'm so happy it's here. They made the decision to make Wario a really cartoony, almost Looney Tunes like character. He goes through spontaneous transformations and like crazy slapstick, and they only go further with this as the series goes on. But it's really neat that they were thinking of this since the start. Bombs themselves oddly go hand in hand with Wario. <laughs> he had a crossover with Bomberman, there's the puzzle game all about bombs. And to this day, one of the most iconic images of his newer series, WarioWare, is the bomb that adopts Wario's smile and mustache. Maybe this is supposed to represent Wario's short fuse and volatile personality. Or maybe I'm just bullshitting, I don't know. Anyway, from here we can finally start our adventure with Wario. Just go into one of the three save pipes and you'll be on your way. So you arrive at Rice Beach, the shore of Kitchen Island. What you might not realize is you can actually hold the B button to look around at the whole island. And there's a lot to it. There's caves, a mountain, a lake, a huge iceberg, a terrifying giant skull, a forest, big fork, and the SST cup, the brown sugar pirate ship. But for now, you don't have any options. Rice Beach. You hit A and it zooms into a smaller area map like in Mario World. Hit A again on the first level and the game begins. And here we are, Rice Beach level 1. Level strewn about with blocks, coins, and short little harmless, armless enemies. Not at all unlike a Mario game. But one of the things you'll probably immediately notice is how much slower Wario is to Mario. The game doesn't have a run button either. But don't sell Wario short, there's a lot more to him than meets the eye. Of course there's the jump. Simple, you can use it to hit blocks like in Mario and you can hold up on the D-pad before a jump to jump higher. Next up, his trademark shoulder bash. Can't have Wario without the shoulder bash. It's a powerful horizontal attack that sends Wario charging towards whatever's in front of him, and you can use it to break blocks and defeat enemies. You can even use it off of ledges and jump out of it, which allows for some really fun platforming. So you'll be jumping around, having a grand old time, and wham, here's a little enemy. These guys look like the Goombas from Mario games, but, but trust me, they're not. They're, they're called Gooms, it's completely different, just, just take my word on this. And when approaching this creature, you'll probably do one of two things. You'll either shoulder bash the enemy, which will kill it and award Wario coin, or you'll jump on it like a regular Mario game. But then you'll see that enemies don't die from a jump like in Mario. Jumping on an enemy actually makes it flip over, which makes them vulnerable to be picked up and thrown like in Mario 2, or some enemies in Mario World. Another main difference between Wario and Mario's, I guess, fighting styles is that Mario takes damage from touching an enemy. If Wario walks into a normal enemy, he just bumps into it without taking damage. Most of them actually get tipped over in the process, letting you throw them. It kind of makes it feel like you're the Mario enemy. Touching you hurts them. Wario can even approach enemies from underneath and jump into them, which is completely unheard of in Mario. There are even enemies where this is the only way to kill them. What will hurt Wario, though, is enemies' armor and weapons. Enemies can have spiky shields, armor, helmets, or just spiky parts of their bodies. Some enemies even shoot projectiles. Despite how derivative the gooms may be, the game actually does have a lot of fun enemy designs. You know, it's got Chicken Duck, Dangerous Duck, Demon Bat, Pecan, which is adorable. It's got Big, which is an apple. Apparently it counts as an enemy, though. Hell, even the gooms will sometimes hold a spiky shield that can hurt Wario. Actually taking damage from these enemies is pretty similar to how it works in Mario games. Wario shrinks down to tiny Wario, sometimes referred to as small Wario. And when Mario shrinks down, he isn't really hindered very harshly, aside from being more vulnerable. And I guess he can't break bricks. But hell, he can even reach certain passageways that you can't reach when you're big. This doesn't apply to Wario because he can crawl in this game. But as the Virtual Boy Wario Land manual says, small Wario has no special powers. Some days I feel like small Wario. His shoulder bash is completely gone, the only way to defeat enemies now is by throwing them into each other. Without the shoulder bash, your platforming abilities are really hindered, and you can't break certain blocks. You'll really miss a lot of what the game has to offer if you trudge around as Tiny Wario. You can still beat the levels with Tiny Wario, but just beating a level isn't what makes Wario Land fun. Seeing as much of the level as possible and exploring every nook and cranny is what makes the game stand out. 
But we'll talk more about that a little later. For now, let's just talk about how to recover from Tiny Wario. Just like how Mario would, to get back to normal size, you need to hit a block to get some food. For Mario, it's mushrooms. For Wario, it's his favorite food. Not crepes, but a head of garlic. This'll turn Tiny Wario back into regular old run-of-the-mill Wario. But if you eat the garlic as regular Wario, you'll turn into Bull Wario. Wario with a Viking helmet, a whole new Wario. Bull Wario can shoulder bash further than regular Wario, he can break blocks faster, and he can ground pound, which actually stuns any nearby enemies. He can even use his horns to cling to the ceiling. This isn't as apparent as his other skills, I actually discovered it by accident, but it allows for some really fun puzzles, and it can even be a good way to take cover so you can avoid certain enemies. That's not it for Wario's abilities, though. In the game's many cute little blocks with eyes that, for the life of me, I could not find a name for, in addition to garlic, they can also spawn three different kinds of power-up pots. Bull pots, dragon pots, and jet pots. Bull pots are simple enough, they let any form of Wario turn into Bull Wario. But more interesting are the dragon and jet ones, since you can't use garlic to get these abilities. Let's start off with Dragon Wario. He doesn't have any unique platforming abilities compared to regular Wario, but his form of attack is completely different. Dragon Wario can't shoulder bash, but he makes up for it by breathing fire. This actually insta-kills most enemies, so you don't have to worry about their spikes or finding their weak point or anything. It's way faster for breaking blocks, and you can even use it straight through walls or underwater. The graphic even changes when you use it underwater, since it's fire. And last but certainly not least is my favorite, Jet Wario. This one first appears in level 2. It's not as powerful in combat as Dragon Wario, but it makes up for it with insane movement options. Jet Wario walks faster, jumps higher, and shoulder bashes even further than Bull Wario. He can even shoulder bash both underwater and in midair. The midair shoulder bash is so much fun. You can skip over certain obstacles, you can find hidden paths, you can collect hard to reach items. It's, it's, it's the best. I've always loved flying power-ups in games and Jet Wario does not disappoint. Once you've braved all of its challenges and reached the end of the first level, you'll see an enemy use a big coin to open the exit door. And then you find out that if you hold up and B for 10 coins, you can summon your own big coin. I actually usually forget this, but the big coin isn't only useful for the end of levels. You can use a big coin for optional checkpoints. It makes you think, do I want to get rid of some of my coins for a safety net? Or do I want to see if I can make it through to the end with my coins intact? Most of the time you'd choose the former, because if you're exploring and fighting enemies, you'll probably have dozens of coins. But the big coins uses don't stop there. You can actually summon it anywhere you want, and throw it at enemies to defeat them from a distance. It's definitely an interesting tactic that can be really useful for tough enemies, so long as you aim it right. Hell, if you're lucky enough and it doesn't fall out of reach, you can even pick it back up. I didn't even realize this, but it's also a great way to attack his tiny Wario, since otherwise he's pretty vulnerable. And now that we've reached the end of the first level, finally, let's talk about the rest of the collectibles, and why they're important to the rest of the game. So, in nearly every Mario game, collecting 100 coins gets you an extra life, another chance if you mess up. In Wario Land, you'll surpass 100 coins and see nothing happen. You'll collect thousands of the things and it won't affect your lives. The purpose of coins changes a lot from Mario to Wario, but that doesn't mean the original functionality is gone. Instead, Wario Land has hearts, which were actually introduced in Mario Land 2, the first game Wario appeared in. Instead of 100 coins, Wario has to defeat 100 enemies to get an extra life. You can also collect hearts that are hidden in blocks, which add 10 points to your enemy counter. Coins, instead, are given a much more major role. Given that one of Wario's most defining character traits is his greed, they've always made it a point in the Wario games to give the coins an important purpose. They change it up in almost every Wario game with how exactly it works, but it always stays true that coins are really important to collect in Wario games. In Wario Land, there's a lot of uses for coins. Of course, I've already talked about the big coin, which you can use to open doors, use checkpoints, and defend yourself. And you might think that's it for the use of coins. You can just keep using the big coin to fight enemies so long as you have enough coins to afford it. But it's not always a good choice to be reckless with your coins. There's a reason why Wario is greedy, after all. At the end of every level, your coins actually get added up into a grand total that counts up to 100,000. But just before you see this counter, you'll actually have the opportunity to choose one of two minigames to play. One game gives you a chance to either double your coins collected in the previous level, or cut them in half. Best case scenario, you'll leave with eight times as many coins as you entered with. But it's just as likely you'll walk out with nothing. The other choice actually has you spend coins you just collected on a minigame that gets you more hearts. I suck at this one. I'm really happy the game gives you options, though. It's really interesting how many uses the coins have and how you might want to change your strategy depending on your skill level. 
Do you want to double your coins so you can see the best ending, or do you want to get more lives so that you don't end up losing more coins if you game over? It's a surprising amount of depth for a game like this. And of course, as I've just been alluding to, the amount of coins you have at the end of the game directly affects how the game ends. The game always ends with Wario paying to build a new home. The kind of home he gets is dependent on how many coins you have. The worst ending is a little birdhouse that Wario can't even fit into. And the best is Wario getting an entire planet to himself, which also has a big picture of his face on it. But collecting as many coins as you can won't get you the best ending alone. There's also 15 valuable treasures hidden in the stages of Wario Land, and they're very well hidden. In my most recent playthrough, I only got two of them. To get these hidden treasures, first off, you'll need to find the block that has a key in it, and you'll usually find the key pretty easily. But the hard part is that not only do you need to find the door it unlocks, but you also need to get there without some of your abilities. Since Wario has to carry the key the whole time, he can't attack without letting go of it. It's really fun to try to find all these treasures, and they all have different designs, as if you're like unearthing certain artifacts. At the end of the game, they get exchanged for a huge amount of coins. But if you get a game over at any point before that, you'll lose some of the treasures you got, and you'll have to go back and find them again. Reinforcing that it's important to both keep your coins close and your lives up. Ultimately, from a gameplay perspective, you don't really get anything for seeing the best ending. It's just a nice virtual reward for a job well done. It's completely up to you if you want to find the treasures and go for a good ending, but could you really live with yourself knowing that Wario has nowhere to sleep at night? You'd probably go to hell. There's a lot of points in Wario Land where you'll beat a level and you'll be like, Wait, I'm on level 20 already? How did I miss so many levels? I got treasure B first, but I looked all over for treasure A! This is where the world map comes in. As I mentioned before, Wario Land takes place on a big island with lots of different areas. And sure, lots of games have map screens, but Wario Land's map is just so impressive to me. There's different level icons that indicate whether or not it has a secret exit, like in Mario World. When you get to Mount Teapot, you'll see it has a lid floating above the top of it. And if you beat one of the levels, it causes the mountain's lid to come crashing down. Then you can go back to a previous level, and the lid is there, and you can fight the boss on top of that lid. Going back to Rice Beach after beating the boss, the tide is higher and levels get flooded and the water gives you access to secret treasures and secret exits. Secrets that you wouldn't have been able to find on your first visit to those areas. This affects the first level, and it's how you get Treasure A. If you play this for yourself, I would highly recommend, after beating each world, to go back and explore the levels you've already been to. Who knows what you'll find? I think it's really cool when games can tell stories with their environments. It's such a simple idea, but it goes such a long way. Even after Mount Teapot, the game continues to be really creative with the map. Later on, you get to the SS Teacup, thinking that's where you'll find the leader of the pirates, Captain Syrup. But instead, at the end of the SS Teacup, you're blasted off of the ship, and you land in Parsley Woods. Also known as Parcelli Woods when you beat the second level. I don't know why this happens. Parsley Woods is not only home to Big Fork, but it also has the train level. I love the train level. It has really fun, unique music, and it's on a train. I mean, what else can be said? After Parsley Woods, you end up at Syrup Castle, which is the true final area of the game. What I really, really like about this area is that at the end of each level, there's no door that you need to pay to get into. Instead, there's a little switch that blows up the castle from the inside, and you actually see this reflected on the map. After you defeat Captain Syrup and her genie, Captain Syrup actually escapes and the rest of the castle gets destroyed, which reveals that the brown sugar pirates did have the statue of Toadstool that Wario was trying to steal. And then after all of this, Mario shows up and takes it back. So Wario just sort of cuts his losses, sells the treasures he collects throughout the game, and he pays the genie to build him a new palace. If you go straight ahead to the next world after Mount Teapot, the level count actually goes from 13 straight to 20. If you actually keep track of the level numbers, you might think, wait, what, what did I miss? And what you missed is one of my favorite secrets of the game. The game has an entire secret world that you can go the whole game without seeing. Sherbet Land. Finding Sherbet Land is honestly one of the most rewarding feelings I've had from a video game in recent memory. It reminded me of being a little kid and playing Mario 64, which is the first game I ever played. The sense of mystery and never knowing what was next was magical to me. The internet definitely does take away a lot of the magic of discovering something for yourself, but discovering that there was an entire secret world and not just a secret level was amazing. It's also one of the only locations from a Wario game that makes multiple appearances in other Mario games. You probably know Sherbet Land from Mario Kart 64. It's right there. It's called Sherbet Land. It's pretty crazy to me that its origin is from Wario Land. Most Mario Kart courses, at least in name, are made up just for Mario Kart. I mean, there's exceptions like Luigi's Mansion and Bowser's Castle, but you, you get what I'm saying. 
Honestly, in every department, this game is so impressive for a Game Boy game. I love the art. Because of his size, Wario is so detailed and expressive, and this goes even further for the game's bosses that I completely forgot to talk about. Their faces are so funny and unique, and it doesn't even seem like it should be possible to have something this distinct on a platformer for the Game Boy. But like, look at Penguin. Look at his face. They're all pretty fun to figure out how to fight, too. And luckily, Tiny Wario is able to take all of them down without the shoulder bash. He doesn't seem too pleased about it, though. Levels are really open compared to most Game Boy games, too. There's this one level in Sherbet Land where enemies are trapped in ice, and you'd think, oh, it's probably, like, for a gameplay purpose, like, they escape. But no, they just put it there because it looks cool. It does that musical thing Mario World does with lots of different level themes with different music genres, but they all use the same motif. Here, take a listen. You really wouldn't expect it based on looking at both characters, but comparing this Wario game to a Mario game, the way Wario plays is a lot more careful than Mario. Mario's gameplay is a lot more reckless, I guess you could say. Mario runs fast, he bounces from one enemy to the next, and even though Mario games do have secret areas, they're not prioritized as much as they are in Wario Land. Mario's is a lot more linear. Wario Land essentially requires you to explore as much as possible if you want the best ending, and if you want to see all the levels. Mario 3 definitely has secrets, but they never really amount to more than a temporary power-up, or a shortcut that lets you see less of a game. You know, you could break a rock to find like an item house, you can use a music box to make the enemies fall asleep, or you can use a cloud to skip a level. Mario World definitely has a lot of secrets, and just like Wario Land, they do lead to different levels and different worlds and stuff like that. Hell, there are even keys. But 2D Mario never really attempted something that ambitious after Mario World, and I really appreciate that its spirit can live on in Wario Land. If it wasn't a sequel to a game called Mario Land, and it were on a home console, I'm sure it would have been called Wario World, and it absolutely deserves that title. Hey, this is Zopra Zeb. Thank you so much for watching my video and listening all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. If you're interested in playing Wario Land for yourself, it's only $4 on the 3DS eShop. If you couldn't tell, I highly recommend it. Yeah, thank you so much for listening. I would really appreciate any critique you can give me. I'd love to get better. This is something I've been wanting to make for a while. I've been thinking of making this video for like four years and I really haven't had the drive to really work on things for a long time and I'm really happy I've finally been able to get this thing out. Um, I definitely want to make more videos like this in the future, so I would really like to know what you think of it. Thank you so much. And hey, since, since you got this far, I want to let you in on a little secret. Uh, if you if you decide to play Wario Land for yourself, if you're in any level, just so long as you're not on the map screen and you're on a level, if you hit pause, hit select 16 times, a small box should appear on your life icon. If you hold B and move left and right, you can move the box around and go to different numbers and change them. You can increase your lives, your coins, your hearts, and your time. Not only this, but if you're holding A and B while you do it, you can select the Wario icon all the way on the left, and you can press up and down to change what form of Wario you're using. So you can have Jet Wario on every level. Um, I wouldn't recommend using it on your first playthrough, because it sort of ruins the challenge, but if you're, if you're struggling, if you keep losing lives, hey, why not, right?